Today, it's not about me. I'm speaking about a whole new, um, well, maybe not new, concept. Moving back about 10 years ago, every time we wanted to make an international call, we had to spend a couple of thousand rupees for a minute. Today, we we're able to, I mean, the whole telecom industry got disrupted because of voice over IP. We're in this midst of disruption of all of the banking sector with what I think is a new uh, acronym called MOIP, money over IP. Today, all our loved and dear ones, we can connect to them, including video, through Skype, through WhatsApp, through Telegram, through what have you, in, um, and also do video at zero cost. And I think that that's kind of disrupting the whole way that, that the telecom industry moved on with, without the voice, but more of the internet protocol. And this revolution that's happening now, the disruption of the, of the um, banking sector that's happening now is with money over IP. I think um, our MC was very kind with the introduction today. And I think one of the biggest changes of money that goes through is I was speaking next, I was sitting next door, next uh, seat with, uh, with the next speaker, is how to bring money from overseas to here, whether that's in pounds or, or dollars or in Japanese yen or uh, euros, and bring that to Nepal and bring that at a time when it's real time, aile ko aile, jahan bahayapani, to make sure that it happens in real time. What we see, and I hope the clicker works, what we see is, Globally, 90% of the wealth is held by 10% of the people. Even in Nepal, historically, we had the, uh, the class system where all of the wealth was with the royalties and a certain class of people. Today, look at what's happening in the banking sector. The promoters and the shareholders, 1% of the people, take most of the profit from the lakhs of the customers. The customers do not benefit from any of the uh, interest and any of the uh, service fees that they pay, and it is all going in terms of dividends, in terms of uh, returns on investment to that 1%. Wealth is being created only to that 1% of the shareholders in the banking sector. We need to disrupt that. Wealth cannot get accumulated to only a certain class of people. We need to bring social justice in how, um, in terms of prosperity, economic prosperity, which is our next agenda for our country, we need to bring over and to bring that across to the mass of the bottom of the economic pyramid, to every village that's out there to see how that social justice can be done. I came across this whole concept of not only open software, but this whole concept of open bank. I attended uh, very recently a, a banking conference called uh, Money 2020 in Singapore about a month and a half ago, two months ago. and. Um, I met the CTO of WeBank, and he offered me saying, take all of my banking software in English and translate that to any of the other languages that you may need, and the whole banking software could have been run. I remember, I think 20 something years ago, and in those years, our banks used to say, why do I need a website? About 10 years after that, they said, of course we have a website. I'm present on somewhere at someone.com, someone at somewhere.com, and I am also using. So they used to now moving on. And about 10 years ago, about uh, seven, eight years ago, they used to say, why do I need an API? Today, all of the banking software, they say, yes, we do have an API. Today, if you look at it, they believe, I mean, Gartner says that we believe that the open bank project will be appealing to developers because of the ability to build an app that can then be um, used by any bank or any customer. Consider a core banking solution that thousands of us are developing, contributing in that open source community so that more and more people are building in payment gateways, building in switches for debit credit cards, building in any of the other e-com uh, services that connects onto the core banking and makes that open API for any bank, every bank, and the whole community is contributing. And I think that's where all of the banking community is going in terms of technology the world over. And I think we need to bring that in. Two banks that I met in this banking conference was, was interesting case studies. Stanchart Bank. They started from the UK. Their biggest banking services was in Hong Kong. And yet they've recently, over the last month and a half, gotten a license from the government of Hong Kong 
to be able to create a virtual Standard Chartered Bank in Hong Kong. No branches, about 150 employees. Most of them are uh, computer uh, engineers. It's run by computer uh, software developers, not by bankers. And some of the other people that's required there are legal experts. It's not run by MBA, it's run by software engineers. Interesting. And on top of that, this, they do not have any tellers. You cannot go to a bank to get money in or money out. The money out that you need would be ATM. If you need foreign exchange, a courier would deliver that into your homes. And all of the bank is through an app. Loans, through an app. Services, all of the banking services through an app. WeBank, Tencent that owns WeBank and that owns WeChat, started WeBank about three years ago. I was very pleasantly surprised to find out that within three years, they're on the top five most transacted bank in the world. And they do not have any branches. They do not have any tellers. It's all a virtual bank that's all on an app. And I think this trend towards getting into the banking where imagine you're sitting two o'clock at night, unable to sleep, worrying about how you would meet your, you would pay your bills tomorrow and you don't have the finances required to pay your bill. If you could go online, be able to apply for a loan, get a approval or a denial within two minutes, provide all the required securities within the next 15 minutes, sign a docu sign or a legal document, and then have the money in your account within 17 minutes to be able to pay out to any bank from your banking. And you think that's a Bollywood, Hollywood story? Uh, reality is that does exist today into quite a few solutions that, that, that's available. The trends that has been in terms of technology that we see is the banks today are still on a centralized manner where they have the servers and their branches are all connected to one central server in their office. And the banks are today in Nepal are getting so afraid that they close off their switches, their swift servers after five o'clock because they fear they will get hacked again like they did two years ago in Tihar where one person comes in and sends thousands of switches um, remittances out of the bank into hundreds of thousands of bank accounts throughout the world. If that was on the cloud, the security guard that has a gun and all the CCTV cameras for the security of that bank does not help that kind of hacking that goes on into the centralized system. We've come to an era of cloud computing where the, the banks go serverless, all the servers are onto the cloud and all of the devices, what have you, whether that's a tablet or a phone or a mobile phone or any of the other devices would get connected to this cloud computing to be able to do services. Come to the next era of the future where a lot of solutions are now coming into a distributed ledger that goes around onto the internet called blockchain. So all of the financial services, all of the ledgers, um, I think our MC talked about me serving into the SARC ICT Council and um, our annual conference was at uh, uh, Kolkata uh, about seven, eight months ago, and which I attended. And I was pleasantly surprised, very, very pleasantly surprised, that the West Bengal government was giving a presentation about their land ownership documents, where the Bihar government was attending, I, and I also attended that session, where all of the land reform, all of the land ownership documents was using blockchain technology. Imagine West Bengal government for the ownership documents using a distributed ledger on the internet, which today cannot get hacked and it, it's distributed across multiple servers so that that information is replicated where for a hacker to get that information, they would have to go at the same time into multiple servers and change the data to be able to benefit from that, which today I think is, is quite a long, uh, long shot for any of the uh, systems to have. I kind of think that for the MOIP to be successful, we need this formula E equals to MC squared. And I'm not talking about E equals to MC squared in physics, but I'm talking about E being ether, uh, Ethereum, which is blockchain, M being all of the members or all of the people that, that start to use it, whether that's on uh, banking services, whether that's on uh, remittances, or whether that's on payment gateways, and C being the cash, the computing, the customers, and all of the computing power coming together. And I think for us to be successful with money over IP, this formula needs to be there. Using the best of the technologies, having a, a majority of the customers. If you look at this company called um, called um, uh, WhatsApp, twenty-two billion dollars was paid for WhatsApp by 
uh, uh, and if you look at it, what do they have? No revenue. They have customers. They've got members. And I think that's what is the is the uh, crux of the uh, of the assets that the uh, majority of the tech companies hold today: customers, members. The M of my formula. The way I see it is in 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 the technology sphere, it's very similar to how Earth is built in. We need the core, and core is the infrastructure. That's all of the internet and all of the computers and the servers and the, and, the, and the data centers and all of that where billions of dollars are being invested into creating that and already exists. Microsoft has Azure and of course the Amazon Web Services and the Google Cloud and the IBM Cloud and Alibaba Cloud and lots of uh, players onto the infrastructure there. Whether that's a local data center or whether that's going onto the global cloud, whether that's a private cloud or that's a hybrid cloud or that's a public cloud. And then the middleware is our connectivity. Today, 136% of our Nepal's population have access to phones in their pockets, more than toilets. I mean, interesting. We value our phones much more than we value uh, taking a biological break anywhere in the, in the wild. I think, but more interestingly, I think is, is this uh, apps onto the edge. That's what makes the difference. And that's where I think we're lacking. Someone came up to me during the break time asking me, saying, um, what would be the next machine learning AI and whether we should invest into being early adopters? I would say, yes, go for it. It's the apps that makes the change, not the infrastructure, not the middleware in terms of connectivity. The connectivity is there. All 77 districts of Nepal today is connected. But I think the difference is, can I make sense of that last mile, that last meter, from the screen onto my brain and be able to use those services to the benefit of my lifestyle. About two years ago, we brought these three superheroes into town. One, what we call Edeva. That's the core banking for all of the cooperatives that we started to develop. That's the center female uh, superhero. Onto the edge was a cooperative uh, platform called Imperial Savings and Credit, and onto the far uh, Left-hand side, my left-hand side, your right-hand side is, is uh, London Money Transfer for the remittance uh, companies. Imagine 36,000 cooperatives in the country. They're very local, very small. They serve a small ward, small community. All of the members know each other. All of the members share the benefits of the cooperative to be able to do uh, all of their banking. And majority of the lending, and that's what banking for me is, not banking for me is not putting my money into a deposit account and getting a six, six and a half percent interest on that. Or sometimes if it is a, uh, a current account or a checking account, there's no interest coming out of that. I think for me, banking is using the banking services to provide me more of credit facilities from the bank itself. And unfortunately, Nepal does not have any banking services that is, that is guaranteed out of uh, non-secure, uh, out of my project or because of my ideas. And a lot of startups that we help with our, our, the biggest challenge that we feel is that access to finance that is not coming through the banking sector. It's coming through our friends, our family, and our angels. And I think today, we're building up a technology where it is free to cooperatives, it's open source, and more importantly, we are, we are trying to build the best of the banking services that, that banks spend crores of rupees to be able to give that, that same benefit to the 36,000 cooperatives that exist in the country. Being able to accept any of the deposits digitally from any of the banks onto the cooperative bank, being able to take that corporate bank account and being able to transfer digitally onto any of the other banks using switches that's already available, and it's uh, switching that's already available from, from other banks' systems and networks that's, uh, that's, and building, connecting that with the APIs. The payment services is the easy part, paying your utility bills, paying your, so every cooperative would be providing all of those uh, uh, television, internet, uh, airline, cinema tickets, uh, and all of those. That's the, that's the easy part. But I think most important is to be able to provide a loan within two, two minutes, the nano micro loans that the banks are not interested in. And, and I think that's what's going to make a, a democratic change onto the way that we look at. If you look at the profits that's made by, um, by all of the, the services that's paid by the customers, all of the interest that's paid by the customers in a bank, who does the profits go to? That 1% of the shareholders and the return on investment, and it's filthy. If you remember, a Nike shoe that was taking more than 20% profit in Dabar Mark was closed down because that was Kalo Bazari, black marketing. 
Today, the banks have published their quarterly reports, and the reports show more than 20% profit. If the government has double standards in terms of banks can make more than 20% in terms of the return on investment that they have, and if that's not black marketing, and a shoe that I sell, and if I charge more than 20% profit on a branded shoe because of all of the uh, rent and high rent and all of the other overheads that I need to pay, and if that's black marketing, there definitely is double standards. Whereas if you look at the co-op banking, the cooperatives do pay, every customer is a member, is a shareholder of, the, of their bank, and these uh, uh, majority of the shareholders are being benefited from the services fees and all of the benefits that they're getting and in terms of profits. The profit is being democratized and shared right among all of the members what they are contributing back. Rasta Bank uh, statistics says 68% of the transactions in the country is going through cooperatives. These 36,000, 35,500 cooperatives. Why do we need so many cooperatives? I think it's very clear. These are small, very local, run by my family members, run by my neighbors, run by other people that I know, and they stay guaranteed to be able to get my banking credit services through the cooperatives. And because of that, I think there is a whole lot of 68% of the transaction. The cooperatives do give a higher rate of interest. The cooperatives do give, um, banks are not able to go to home to home. The cooperatives are known to have collectors, are known to have field officers that give, that go around and even get 100 rupees deposit from customer to customer, that recurring deposits, the schemes that they have. And, and there are, the bank goes to the customer rather than the customer coming to the bank. And they are changing the way that we do banking with, with the cooperative movement. If you look at, um, you say cooperatives are a risk, three out of the 28 commercial banks have failed. Six out of the 36,000 cooperatives have become uh, uh, troublesome or have become, has been declared. So I don't know where the risk, the high risk is, whether that's three out of six or six out of 36,000. So um, I think there's a whole global movement to say unbank yourself. Their social justice is to move on and look at the, the uh, way that I would benefit from all of the banking services that I get and uh, that uh, the social, uh, uh, the benefits that I get from a cooperative movement rather than from a very traditional bank. And these are, they are cartelling together to make sure that they are not able to raise the interest that they give to the consumers. There's a strong lobby, not for the customer, but for the protection of the shareholders. And they are making sure that no other bank comes into the market, they, because there are too many, they would rather merge and increase their profitability in that, in that process. Today, two days ago, there was a headline into Kathmandu Post saying, the banks do not have enough liquidity to give out loans, but they have the highest profit so far in history. I'm saying, let's join, just like the open source movement onto the open bank movement, and also the unbank yourself movement. Bank with a cooperative rather than a traditional bank. Break yourself through the wall. Change the way that you do your banking. Do not bank with a bank, go with a cooperative radically different. And I think the talk that I wanted to end off with, this is peer-to-peer -peer where every person is depositing every person because of the personal guarantees that I have. I'm getting unsecured loans from the banks, but I think this is more power to the people. Power to the people. Thank you very much, my dear.